Oh, this is such a bummer. All right. It'll work out. Welcome to Fly Time 45 Minutes from 515 to 6 o'clock, everybody. Ah, we're back. Huh? Hi, everybody that we were experiencing some YouTube technical difficulties. Hopefully you stayed with us. And we've kind of introduced Amy, introduced some of the flat flies. This is called Trigger Candy, and she's going to start tying this straight away. All right. This is what it looks like. Now, they, they don't all look the same because, I, you know, usually I make a batch and I'll uh, cut up a bunch of legs and mix the colors. So they're always a little bit different. Um, what I'm going to start with is an Airx hook. This is a NS150 curved shrimp hook. Okay, so it's got a little bit of a curve to it. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna debarb it because I always fish barbless no matter where I am. No matter what I'm fishing for, it's always barbless. When you talk about barbless, Amy, I think if you get a fish hook to the bend of the hook, you're going to catch them if you can keep the line tight. This barbless is darn near better for the fishermen than the fish even. I think, I don't know. I've always fished barbless. I've landed plenty of fish on barbless hooks. I yep. think the bend of the fish's mouth easier. Now let's talk a little bit about the hook. There is a long evolution to get to this hook for this fly. Trigger fish have notoriously tough lips it's like trying to hook a rubber bicycle tire so right. at first and they're also really strong fish so at first the guide would look at your fly and go nope that hook is not strong enough that hook is not thick enough that hook is not strong enough for a trigger well the problem with a really thick strong hook for a trigger is that you couldn't get it to penetrate into their mouth so they would grab it and you set the hook with a little strip set and they, you could not get it to penetrate. So I went with a more hypodermic needle kind of type of hook. And it seems to, you seem to have a better hook set. Now, don't be surprised if you're fishing for triggers and your fly ends up looking like this after one trigger. Because yeah. this is a mutilated bent. Can you all see that? That this this fly caught one trigger and was mutil mutilated and bent. I've also seen trigger fish bite fly rods in half. While so we'll be okay, James. Right. And then, you know, the other thing with that longer hook that you're using, I think they'll eat gotchas and stuff on occasion too, but with that longer hook, if they get it behind their teeth, your line's going to break. But most of the time when you hook a trigger with that hook, es que ve, mira, not, andamos por abajo de los mil aquí. I think that's a huge benefit for lots of saltwater species with teeth. Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put on I'm going to put on some eyes. We're going to put some lead eyes on this. And the lead eyes are going to go on top and the fly is going to ride upside down. So we'll flip it later when we are working on the uh the little legs. So when I first tied this fly, I used really bright eyes, like double pupil lead eyes like these. And then I became more and more worried about spooking these triggers because every time I went back to Christmas Island, and I I go back to Christmas Island as often as I can, but sometimes it right. would be like three trips a year. And even in the months between trips, they would get smarter and spookier. So... I decided to come up with uh, my own kind of tan eyes. And I've made a video on, on this, on making your own color of eyes, but I've got a powder coating and a fluid bath and I make little tan eyes, which are not as sexy for the tying video, but they are way better for fooling triggers. So these are my handmade tan eyes. There's a video on YouTube on how to make these eyes. It's just a uh, just a regular set of lead eyes, and then we're gonna we t we dip them into this powder. We heat them up and dip them in the powder. Bruce, you've been over at my house, and we've had our mad science making of eyes. Now, what I'm gonna do after I wrap those eyes on, they're pretty steady on there, but I'm gonna give them a little hit of UV glue, and I'm using a pro UV resin here, and. This is going to come out of the bottle. Come on. I just, whoa, here it comes slowly. All right, just getting a little bit of glue on these. The more tough your saltwater fly is, the better. 
So we're going to get those eyes really locked on there. Now there's no way they're going to move. And I'm going to wrap to the back. This is a really simple pattern in terms of material and ingredients. Both of the flies I'm tying today are just super basic in terms of materials because I don't need a lot of fluff and circumstance. I don't need a, I don't need a, a fly to take me 30 minutes to tie. I want to whip a bunch of these out so I can start handing them out to people when I get to Christmas Island. Um, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to dub a little fat body back here. We're going to stay with the tan theme. This is a uh, hair tron dubbing like Cahill. Um, I've also used uh, ice dub UV tan, uh, any kind of tan dubbing that you want, just something mellow. I've also used like a cinnamon ice dub. Um, different body colors are okay, but I like to keep them fairly mellow in color. So we're going to just dub up a little body here. I'm not even going to use a dubbing loop. I'm just going to just going to dub regularly and just get a nice little body built up. So. Amy, I'm not um, disinterested as I'm looking down. We're having some technical di difficulties. I'm trying to keep the tablet ready to roll so I can answer questions or let you know who's coming in and it just i'm kind of it's constant maintenance here so what you're saying is we have no first i'm just doing this to a ghost audience well i can't tell because it's going in and out so quickly now you have you have people viewing but i just want to be able to look for questions as they come up as well all right well i'll just keep dubbing this takes a little while i do it the slow way yes i know how to make a dubbing loop uh, i'm just not i'm not at my normal fly tying desk at the office where we have fast internet and uh i just don't have everything that i normally have which is fine we can still tie flies without all the bells and whistles and right and with this particular fly would you really i mean does the spikiness of a dubbing loop add anything to this fly or would you rather taper it up with a traditional <laughs> dub straight to the thread yeah, not, I mean, not really. You don't need it to be spiky. It's it's just basically a little, I had to put a body behind that, but the, right. the real thing on this fly are the, the rubber legs that stand up like this. So I've dubbed enough of a body right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little more dubbing on the thread um, a little bit further down. And you're going to see why I do that. I'm just going to put it right here. You can use dubbing wax if you have it. I don't personally have any right here right now. All right, so we have got that the, the body dubbed and I've left a little space behind the eyes here. Can you see that little space behind the eyes? That's where I'm gonna tie my legs in. But I'm gonna rotate the fly upside down here. And that, that can you all see that? That's where I'm gonna tie my legs in. So what I have for yeah. legs, is a nice pile of rubber legs, a mixture of colors. This is what we have in there. We've got chacones, barred rubber legs in brown and white or brown and clear. We've got silicone flutter legs in tan. I've got some more chacones, barred crusher legs, fluorescent pink and clear. I got some loco legs in there, shrimp pink. And my favorite, and I had a heart attack when they discontinued these for a while, but they're back. Medium round rubber legs in natural cream. So those were not available right after I invented this fly and I had a mini heart attack, but they then they started making them again. So Amy, when you look at that pile of legs in your hand, if you were to kind of put them in both hands and make them circular, is that about the size of a number two pencil thickness wise? Yeah. <laughs> Just maybe a tiny bit thinner than a number two pencil. I probably have count wise. I mean, I could have more. I could have less. Some of these I make a little sparser, like this little guy right here. This will still catch fish. It just doesn't have quite as many legs, and they're all the same color. You see that one? Yeah. That, that's, you know, a little sparser version. Sometimes I make them more cream, so they're not, they're not um, scary to the fish. But uh, I mean, you know, sometimes I'll mix up the colors and go with more of a kind of an earth tone like that one. But th this one here is probably my most common color combo, which is 
a little bit of pink, a little bit of orange, a little bit of cream, and a little bit of brown and white. So you'd say it made somewhere between 20 and 40 legs, and then that amount's going to double the way they're tied in, right? Yeah, uh, it's not going to, well, yeah, it's going to double because we're going to parachute them up like that. Okay. So I'm going to tie them in now. This is a little tricky the first time you do it. Um, thread that I'm using is a hundred denier thread. This is a hundred denier Vivas thread. And I'm using a hundred denier because you can't break this stuff. And I want to get those all tied down right in the middle. And then I've got to tie that thread kind of through the legs a little bit, kind of like you do when you're doing deer hair. I want to get that thread through all those legs and get it. Yeah, around. so you've got good compression to the legs, to the hook, knowing that those triggers are still going to ruin it. <laughs> but yeah. you need that to at least catch these, one. These last all have one trigger, but it's still, you want it to look cool. Okay, now I brought my dubbing up, and my dubbing is right underneath the legs. And just going to turn my right bobbin a little tighter. You need a little more pressure. This would be really a hard fly to do without really strong thread. So you could use like a, a mono thread, a Kevlar thread. Um, this is like a gel spun thread. You want to be able to really crank on that thread. So once I've got them tied down, I'm going to bring them up like a little parachute. And I'm going to wrap around the front and then I'm going to wrap around ah you got to kind of try to corral all those legs bad hair day it's a, yeah it's a bad hair day the word in kitty boss for um standing up all over the place is wakaka so that's, <laughs> that's what right. guys call this this fly they call it a wakaka trigger candy. Love it. Oh, but, and then every time we hook a trigger with this fly, we scream out candy. I hooked on the last day of fishing this year. Remember, Bruce, the last day any American fished Christmas Island, February 19th. I, I hooked like nine triggers that day. Some That's right. Some on the next fly that I'm going to show you. But I probably cast to uh, a lot more than that. So basically, that's it. I've wrapped the uh, I've wrapped the dubbing around like a parachute style. And now I'm just going to trim the legs because obviously we don't want them this long. Um, so I'm going to trim them up because it makes it easier to finish the fly, the head and everything when you got them trimmed up. Right. I'm going to trim Was that them pretty I trim them a little long at first so that I don't accidentally go too small. But that's perfect right there. If you want them even more compact, that's fine. But you see they have a good action when they're trimmed like this. And I think this fly would work not only for triggers. I think you can tie this. The first ones I ever tied of this fly, I tied in black and I tied them in purple. And I think this would be an awesome permit fly. Um, this fly would just, I think permit would crush this fly because they love urchins. So right. It looks like an urchin. It also looks like that little uh, worm that I showed you in the book. So I'm just, right now I'm just kind of putting a little bit of dubbing up in, in the front. I want the landing of this to be a little bit soft. So I usually try to dub a lot between the lead eyes so that there's a little bit of softness when it lands so it doesn't go kerplunk and that this that is, is great i mean when you when you look at that fly trying to reverse tie it by looking at a finished fly it would seem really difficult but once you walk you know we just watched you put it together and post it like a parachute and they go oh i can do that yeah it's it's not that hard to tie um it just at first it's a little bit frustrating because if you don't have the right thread and you can't get a hard wrap down on that it'll it'll fall apart on you and so that's yeah. the trigger candy. i just finish it up with a, a teeny bit of um, pro resin just at the head and i want that to be durable enough to at least maybe catch a couple of triggers 
Yeah. And then for those that haven't fished a whole lot of flat saltwater, Amy, talk about, I mean, the majority of the flies that you fish from knee deep to waist deep water are, they're going to, they're going to ride hook keel up. Right. So this fly also has UV quality. So you can see how the legs really shine. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, you when this fly lands, it will always land with those little legs up in the air. I'll show you. It's always going to land just like this. And it's going to, you can't really even see the eyes. And when I showed this to James, um, when we were getting ready to make this, James Shaughnessy, the Beulah, the owner of Beulah Fly Rods, he said, wait a minute, I thought that had eyes on it. That's the magic of the tan eyes, Bruce. You can't see them. Um, we used right. to use use real bright eyes, of course, like this. But I, you know, to each his own. You can use bright eyes still if you want. Um, I like the tan eyes because it, then the only thing highlighted the showcase here is this great little wiggly legged thing. And if you were going to go camo and you didn't have the ability for a tan eye, could you replace that with a gold eye? Yeah, gold. For stealthy. Gold eyes that look like this. I've got them right here. If you didn't have the ability to make your own eyes, this is as close to a tan eye as I have found, is this little gold eye. There we go. And that's still going to be really stealthy. That's pretty darn stealthy. Yeah. Um, actually, like this white eye is actually still pretty stealthy when it's in there, you know, mm -hmm. underneath all that stuff. I mean, you can go as stealthy as you want. Obviously, if you're using these in Mexico, you don't need to be stealthy at all because as we talked about, those triggers are are not spooky. But I, I'll show one, one more time. I'll just show the picture of what we're really imitating here. This is my Reef Creatures of the Tropical Pacific book. And these are Christmas tree worms. And this fly does a good job of imitating those. There's a whole yeah, bunch it's of a spot on imitation. And there's so many colors of them. Yeah. So I, I like to use these books because I like to geek out and think about what those fish might be eating. Right, Bruce? Absolutely. I mean, that, we poured over those books for hours at your house with gobies and all the other things we know they eat and trying to yeah. figure out new flies are going to be the next big fly. Absolutely. One fly I'm not going to show you today because it's the brand new fly that will be experimented with next time I go to Christmas Island is a goby imitation. And gobies are these, are these little reef fish. So I have the reef creature book and I also have the reef fish of the Tropical Pacific book. And what gobies are, I think people use them in their aquariums. Gobies are these, these funny little fish that look like that. And you see the one that's upside down here? See that guy? Yeah. They orient themselves upside down, which, which is perfect because the eyes that we have, these double pupil lead eyes look exactly like goby eyes, right? You see those goby eyes. And then I gotta think that the fish are eating those gotchas 90% of the time as a goby and not so much a little shrimp. Oh, for sure. Like, see this candy cane goby right here? Yeah. See this little fly right here? That's my little it's candy. Perfect. This is my little candy cane goby that will be going to Christmas Island with me next year. So love it. We we're gonna we're gonna not tie that one for you because we have to make sure it works. Bruce and I will go do some R and D with that one. So Amy, tell me about size range on the uh, trigger candy. Is that always size six? Do you go down to size eight? Gonna, you can. I go down to size ten on that. Um, th that ten would be much smaller, obviously. Um, I like to tie a lot of flies in size eight and 10 for the tropics. I mean, for Christmas Island, because I think they see so much big stuff that when it, when it gets tough, when they get pressured, I want to go down to a, a hook this small, size 20, just a little. Got dogs barking. That's not in my place. 
I don't know where those dogs are. Sorry about from. that. He's a wine runner named Sage. All right. He's letting the UPS guy know who's boss. That's a good thing. So I know we kind of flew uh, through that. Box. And then with you get a good quality hook, Amy, do you, there's no problems with the size 10 spinning out as long as you get a good quality hook. Yeah, as long as you have a really stout, like strong hook, but I probably wouldn't fish tens. I use a lot of tens for bonefish, but for triggers, you know, let's talk a little bit about triggers, Bruce. I'll put the fly back up in the vise. Um, triggers, in case people don't know anything about them, they're really funny looking fish, and they have this great little habit of wanting to run back to their house when you hook one. So while most fish are just running out into the ocean, triggers like to live in their little coral caves. And the first thing they want to do when you hook them is run back and hide in their house or their, right. their hole. And um, the, you have to stop them from doing that. So oftentimes when you hook a trigger, um, the, your guide will start screaming, you know, run over here, run over here, because he wants you to go stand right on top of their their house so that they can't go inside of it you right. had that happen right bruce oh i've lost a few triggers to the hole yeah. absolutely once they go in there it's nearly impossible to get them out um a few guides are really good at doing it i had a guide uh one time it was pete at a kari house and i hooked my first big trigger and it ran across the the white sand flats and right into its hole and it was almost like I was fighting this fish, fighting this fish, and all of a sudden it was stopped. And I was like, yep. what is going on? And he's like, he's in his hole. He's in his hole. I didn't know what that meant. So we, I reel up and walk across the flat, and pretty soon I'm just staring down at this hole, and my line is in the hole. And Pete goes, here, hold my radio. And he hands me the radio, and he takes his, you know, all his pliers and everything off, and he gets down up to his neck in the water. He can barely breathe in it. Both his arms are in the hole. And he folds the trigger. They have a trigger on top of their head. And that folds them in the hole. But if you fold the trigger down like that, then you can get the trigger out of the hole. So right. he reached in there. He was moving his hands around. And all of a sudden, he delivered a baby. The, the trigger was like, he delivered this baby to me. And, <laughs> and I pose for a picture with it and then let it go and it was like super fun um it was it was a funny moment to see that happen so then ever since then you want to kind of have a game plan and know where their hole might be because they might want to run right to their hole and if they do most of the time you have to just break them off right and even if you keep them out of their home hole or a second home hole you might think you're in the clear and they're going to run into a visiting hole they will. Always, oh, yeah. You're never done with a trigger until it's in your hands. They do. All right. So Amy Hazel, Jenny O'Brien types in and says, hi, guys. Hi, Jenny. Hello. J-O-B, watching yep. some fly time. Great. All right. So we're here. And the question she has that just came okay. in is, give us a couple of line recommendations and rod weights specifically for triggers and CXI. All right. Well, uh, for triggers, I like to use... A nine weight, I think, is the ideal line weight to use for triggers. Uh, you can get them on an eight, but you'll maybe sometimes struggle with the bigger triggers. It's a little bit harder to control them with an eight. Um, a 10 weight works well, too. Uh, but I found that I just like a nine weight. It's more fun to cast. Um, Bruce, you loaned me a nine weight a Beulah rod, and I took it down there. And that's when I was like, this is the perfect weight rod to have for triggers. So... That's what I use now. Line right. wise, line wise, we're just using a, a saltwater line. I've used lots of different ones. You want something that can cast something pretty heavy. So that depends a little bit on your skill level. Um, there are some lines that make casting uh, big flies easier. Uh, currently, I, I've been using a scientific angler amplitude line. Um, it's textured. It makes a little bit of noise, but it's a it's a great saltwater line. I really enjoy it. Um, Beulah makes some great lines too. Some really good saltwater lines. Um, I have used serum. those. Bruce, you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and the serum is a, uh, an integrated sinking tip line. And um, a lot of times I really like using that when I'm 
playing more of the bait fish game for the trevallis, be it bluefin or whatever species of trevally, giant trevally. The flats lines, I even went as far as I just wanted to try a 10 weight line on that nine weight rod and upline it once for the wind and the size of the flies with the dumbbells. And SA told me that you can get their tarpon line, which we're not going to see a tarpon and see a side. But they yeah. said it's a continuation of the bonefish line, but they said it didn't make sense to make a bonefish 10 weight. So if you didn't know that, now you know you can grab a tarpon line where there's no tarpon. If you need a little bit more oomph for a nine weight, or that line is just, it's supple and it works for bonefish as well if you're fishing bigger bonefish and heavier flies and windier situations. So um, I think we end up seeing a lot of SA lines down there for the actual flats. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're they're good lines. I like them. I've used Rio, of course, too. Um, had some Rio lines de lamb since they went to that in touch, and it, that was kind of disappointing. But um, hopefully, they've got that situation under control. Uh, let's try a really easy fly. Um, I mean, that that fly is pretty easy, but this fly is really easy. And I've been kind of designing easy flies. Because a lot of times we're tying these while we're at Christmas Island. Um, we bring a vice. We bring all our fly tying stuff. You're usually like dripping with sweat because it's so hot there. And you've got at midnight. Little, yeah, you got a little breeze coming off the ocean. But we're out there at the in the gazebo tying flies with any of the younger guides that want to show up and tie flies with us. It's fun, isn't it? Right. Those are those are that's my favorite almost part of the whole deal is how yeah. into it they are and what we learn. Well, I'm really glad that when we were there the last week before the total shutdown, um, that we brought them so many fly tying materials, hooks, scissors, a right. thread, all that stuff, because hopefully they've been able, like, like so many people judging by my fly tying material orders here at the shop, they've been able to uh, relieve some of the boredom by tying flies themselves. Right. And they say that the only way they can give materials is if we're willing to bring it and leave it. They really can't get their hands on it. Even if they have the money to buy it, they just have no way to get material. Right. If you're ever going down to Christmas Island, always think about bringing some practical things for the guides like that, like nippers, like croquis to hold their sunglasses, sunglasses. There's a million things that they really need that they can't get. All right. We ready for the next fly, Brucey? They don't need sunscreen. I don't think I've ever seen a guide put it on. Uh, they, they wear buffs. <laughs> they don't use it. They wear buffs. Yeah, they wear buffs. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. All right. So the next fly that I'm going to tie is the uh, peaking prawn. Let me see. Where did my peaking prawn go? It's peaking. It's not peeking out at me here. Uh, <laughs> I can't, uh, oh, yes, I do. Toothy, toothy ocean critters, Amy. Yes. Would you... Have you or would you recommend a bite guard down there for those fish that have teeth? Well, trigger fish teeth are, are are like, usually they don't break the line. They usually they usually suck the fly in and spit it out before you can even hook them. And when you do hook them, um, you, I haven't really broken many off in terms of being bitten off. Once in a while, they will bite far enough up the line. But we don't really use any kind of uh, wire leader for trigger fish. Now, if you wanted to target CUDA, um, Bruce, didn't you have a bunch of CUDA one day that you kept getting your flies eaten off? Uh, I only lost three. I called the game over. The guy told me after the first one that I could strip faster and the, fly, and the fish would only get the fly. So we stripped yeah. faster and ran backwards, lost another one, tried it a third time, and only had so many flies for four more days. All done. Yeah. yeah, you have to have wire for barracuda or it's, they're going to lose your stuff. Yeah, that's where the toothy critter leader comes in. But usually at Christmas Island, we're not targeting cuda. So it's like one comes along, you think it's something else, you cast to it. All of a sudden, you're you're like, oh, no, that was a barracuda. I landed one on just 40 yeah. pound plural, but that was super lucky, I realize now after hearing you come back that day and say how many broke you off. 
No kidding. And we were actually targeting in that day too because fishing was off. But yeah, I would I will never go back without it. And then I think if you were going to stay offshore with tunas and that kind of stuff, you could use there's some there's some critters with teeth out there too. Oh, yeah. uh, but in in the flats. Yeah. And the other thing is, is those triggers will bite right through a hook occasionally. And I think that the trigger could probably bite through a wire guard. Oh, easily. I mean, like I said in earlier yep. intro, um, I went to Christmas Island with this, this couple and uh, Danae caught her first trigger fish and she was pointing it at the camera because they have such cool teeth and her or this rod was tucked under her arm over here. And then she turned it sideways, this angle, and she was holding it like this. And the trigger just chomped down on her rod and bit it in half. And he had such a smug look. And on that's his the face butt section, that. not the tip, right? No, it was it was like the middle of the rod. But he was so he that's was still so pretty burly graphite. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he just bit it. So that was probably an interesting story to have to tell to Orvis about how she broke her rod. Right. But All back right, to so the wire thing, if you're on the flats for bonefish and triggers, if I can get away with a 20 pound leader and they're not spooky, I'll do that. Um, yeah. A lot of times a 16 and if they're spooky, you got to lengthen and go down to a 12 pound, but somewhere between 12 and 20 pound, nine to 14 feet, you're in the game. Always oh, start with nine foot and lengthen as needed. Yeah. With triggers, I usually use like 16 pound, um, 20 is, yeah. you know, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty uh, interesting. Once you get one to actually follow your fly, it's super fun because they tilt down and eat it and you strip and you try to get that fly in their mouth. And I've watched the guides. I let the guides fish a lot and watch how they do it. And even they get super frustrated because the, the right. fish, eat, but your timing has to be just luck it's lucky a lot of it's luck to get that that fly to you know get in their mouth all right let's do another fly let's do the peaking prawn so this is another really simple pattern with just a few ingredients um and it's attractive to the fish because of these little eyes that stick out the back now at christmas island we have and sometimes i'll tie this with tan eyes but today i'm going to tie it with orange eyes at Christmas Island, there are a lot of um, mantis, big mantis shrimp. And they have these little beady eyes that kind of glow out the back of them, out the back of the, um, here's a picture. So you see that mantis shrimp and you see those two little beady eyes? I yep. think those, those kind of little beady eyes are a good, a good trigger for um no pun intended a trigger for triggers to eat or uh bonefish in that case so i have a question for you amy you ran out of an eye color at christmas island in that two week trip was it that same color that i mean the fishing productivity went down severely when you ran out of those eyes yeah it was these little eyes right here i only brought one pack because this was an experimental fly that i wasn't wasn't really even expecting uh to use but these flies um that i have here are aqua flies and, and what's the specific color that's hot orange there we and go we know they work the size of this is a uh, uh, medium now i just want to say when it comes to eyes like this yes these are a little bit pricey i can't remember the price on these but um, you can make your own. A lot of people like, I like to make a lot of my own stuff. I'm going to show you really quickly how you can make your own eyes. So this is a heavy mono, about a 50 pound mono. And if you want to make your own eyes that glow, you can do that quite easily with a little 50 pound mono and a lighter. And all you're going to do is just burn this mono until you get a little bulb of an eye. Can you see that? Yeah. All right. So I get a little bulb of an eye. You burn it a little bit more, trying to get a little bit more of a bulbous eye. You get a nice little bulbous eye. And then you can take a material like any of these super bright UV glues. This is a golf resin. This one's hot orange. You can do hot pink. You can make these eyes any color you want. They do come store-bought in a lot of colors, but I'm just going to make a little bit of a hot orange eye here. 
put a little dot of this on here. There's your orange. And then I'm gonna hit it with the UV light. And then- Ooh, that you, looks pro. Yeah, you can put another coating on, you can put a little black dot on, but all you need is just a little bit of a hotness in the back of the fly. So you can use these little peeking eyes that I have from Aquaflies, or you can make your own eyes um, economically. All and right. if people haven't used the Gulf resin, Amy, I mean, I'm a big believer in the Pro Thin Flex resin. As that well. Gulf stuff, if you want a colored resin, it works, it sticks, it's not tacky, and it's durable like a resin should be. It's not at all. And then if you wanted to put a pupil on that eye, you can get the Gulf, the Black Gulf, uh, Black Magic Gulf, which is just would allow you to put a little dot if you really wanted the the eyeball effect. Or you can just yeah, perfect. straight orange like that. So let's tie this fly. It's super easy. All right. We're going to put a uh, NS150 A-Rex hook. The NS150 curved shrimp hook. I'm going to go with a size 8 on this guy. And before I begin, I'm going to debarb the hook. Because I always fish barbless hooks. Good for the fish, good for the back of your neck. Good for the fish, good for the back of your neck. All right. So you want to make sure your hook's really in that vise. This is a new vise for me, and it's um, it's a it's a regal vise, and I've been tying on regal for over twenty years. But you have to kind is of is that find the revolution? The, yeah, it's the revolution. Uh, you kind of have to find the sweet spot on the vise to make sure the the hook's really in there because we're going to be cranking a little bit. Um. Thread-wise, for this one, I'm going to use a... Can you shut that door, please? Sorry, we got a little bit of a flow back here in the back of the shop. Anyone who's ever been here knows that the back of the shop at Deschutes Angler is a place where a lot of people come at 5 o'clock. Is, is it because you guys are popular or because you have whiskey? Uh, it's really fun most of the time, but not when you're trying to do YouTube live video. And you have everybody in the neighborhood showing up. Go away! So, this is the thread that I'm using. It's an ultra thread. This is 140 denier, and the color is fluorescent shell pink. All right, this is a popular color. Um, another thread that I've used is a Vivas. This is a Vivas thread. You can't see it because it's on the right bobbin, but the Vivas thread in pink. All right. So, but we're going to do this one in the 140 denier ultra thread fluorescent shell pink. So, so for people that don't know, Amy, the 140 is going to be closer to a three, -aught, a strong thread. The 70 denier is going to be more like a six or an eight. Aught. Exactly. And with saltwater flies, it's absolutely okay to have a big head. Now, if I were here tying steelhead flies, I'm an absolute Nazi about having the tiniest little perfect head on my steelhead fly, but Saltwater flies, a lot of them end up having a fairly big head. It's it's not aesthetically unpleasing on the saltwater fly as it is right. on the fly. All right, so I'm going to put some orange eyes on this guy. And what I'm using for eyes is a uh, double pupil lead eye. I put all my double pupil lead eyes in, in one little puck because I don't like opening packages. But... Uh, if you do keep all your stuff in packages, a little trick that I learned from Ron Shirashi, who's a great fly tire, is to always use these little book rings and to keep your light materials together, whether it's rubber legs or, or anything Dubbing. else. It's so much easier to find everything that way. Right, Bruce? Sure. One ring for your steelhead dubbing, one ring for your saltwater dubbing, one ring for your eyes. It's a great way to go. All right. So we're going to tie these eyes on. And just lash them on here. You can see you're just going one way and then coming around the other way. And then we also make saddle wraps and figure of eight. And then we go around the base of the fly. So you really want to get these eyes wrapped. What I notice is the first thing a lot of saltwater guides do is test your eyes on your fly. They, they do. Before they tie it on. They try to twist those eyes. So it's sort of like when they grab those eyes, you're just like, please don't twist. Please don't. 
Um, but you can use a little, if you want to help yourself out a little bit. I'm using the Pro UV Thin Resin, which I should have gotten a new bottle because this stuff is a little bit, I'm a little bit low on it. So I have to squeeze like heck to get it out. But this is going to help get that locked down. Little UV light. Now, when it comes to UV resins, you guys, there are a lot of UV resins on the market and they're not all created equally. Uh, some will stay really tacky. Uh, some, some just don't last as long as others. I found that this Pro UV Resin Thin Flex, I put eyes on flies with this. They don't come off. Other resins, the eyes will be off after like three casts. You bring your fly back and it's blind has no more eyes. And I'm not talking these kind of eyes. I'm talking like those flat little doll eyes or whatever kind of eyes you're using on the fly. Another thing about tying with UV resins is that not all UV lights are created equally. Um, there's a million UV lights available on the market. I've been through about seven different kinds. I ended up sticking with this uh, rechargeable Loon light it's a little bit expensive, but you do get to recharge it. And the charge lasts forever. I haven't recharged this since before we left for Christmas Island. And you know I tie flies almost every night, Bruce. So yeah, those batteries can be 14 bucks a piece and some need two batteries. I mean, yeah. I don't know if that's a micro USB or USB-C they put on that loon light, but that was a genius idea. That's the best light on the market. Well by, worth the money. By far. Yeah, it's a little bit expensive, but I think it's totally worth it. So well, my hopefully you're still holding one for me because as soon as you put it on hold for me, COVID happened and we couldn't travel. <laughs> I know. I'll send it to you, Bruce. I have it. Uh, right. Yeah, we could do that. And then, you know what else, Amy, is that with that, whether you're using Golf or Pro, you put a little bit of resin on the eyes. You surprisingly don't need a ton of it to hold those eyes in place. A little bit goes a long ways with both of those. Good resins, you don't need to use a lot. That's a fact. It's just controlling how fast it comes out of the tube that can be a little tricky. Sure. All right. So now we've got our eyes on. We're going to put our second set of eyes on, our peaking eyes. And now I just have to locate them. There they are. Okay. So we're going to put our our peaking eyes on. These are, these are made by Aquaflies. They're called Ultra Eyes. This particular size is medium. The color is hot orange. Now these Ultra Eyes come either with pupils or without I chose to go with the pupils on this one just because they're peaking that way. Well, and you know, it worked really good. And they did work. <laughs> they worked very well, Bruce, didn't they? All right. Yes, they did. So when you pull them out of the package, these eyes are, they're pretty long. So you're going to want to trim that monofilament because you don't need that much. So I'm going to trim that one down and I'm going to trim the second one the same length. I'm just trimming the mono off because we don't need it all that mono. And now we're going to tie one eye in at a time, peeking out the back of the hook. And they're just peeking out a little bit beyond the bend of the hook. This can be a little tricky because you want that mono. Excuse me, I have an eye in my mouth. You want that mono to stay right even with the, the shank on the side that it's supposed to stay on. And now I'm going to put the other one. If you've cut them to the same length, then it's easy to tie them from the back and know that they're both going to be exactly the same length. And because this mono that they're made out of is really stiff, you can kind of separate them so that they peek out. Does, can you see that? Yeah, see that's a, it's very good on the on the video. Yeah, so you can see that how they they peek out there. Now. There's only one other ingredient in this fly. <laughs> That's how easy it is. See, I'm taking a I'm taking a group of um, 16 women to Christmas Island, and and a lot of us, a lot of the women on the trip, haven't really tied flies before. So I wanted to have a few patterns that I could show them that are easy to tie, can give you confidence, and it's so fun to go to a destination where you've got flies that you tied yourself. So yeah. that, I, that's why we did this. Now, the next ingredient in this fly is craft fur or pseudo hair, it's sometimes called. And this stuff, this is what they make Muppets out of. <laughs> <laughs> 
So usually it's more colorful for Muppets, but our stuffed animals. So anyway, this is what I used on this. It's a pseudo hair in sand. I've also tied this fly with a little bit, um, a little bit finer hair. This is the uh, extra select craft for in tan, um, sand or tan. You can tie this fly. This fly also looks really good in uh that's not tan this is in the wrong bag but this is an olive colored pseudo hair so you can tie it in a lot of different a lot of different colors and that that craft fur and the pseudo hair the the pseudo hair almost feels a little more silky doesn't it amy it, it is different yeah the pseudo hair is a little different this is a little stiffer but i better get cracking here because we're nearing the uh end of the show here so i'm just gonna cut a a little chunk of uh pseudo hair and i'll i'll admit i never really worked with this stuff all that much before i know a lot of people use it for steelhead flies and stuff i always use more natural materials like you know polar bear arctic fox marble fox all that stuff but that stuff's getting harder and harder to get and so we have to rely on um non-natural man-made materials all right so i've just i've just pulled out some of the shorter guard hairs underneath that are in there that are kind of making this bulky to tie down. So I'm getting some of that out of there, but I'm still keeping the longer hairs back here. And I'm just going to tie hey, this in. I'm we have a question. Right here. And it's going to help build the body. I'm just tying that, tie that down. What are the average size? We have a question that came in, Amy. The average size of the trigger and how big do they get? <laughs> um, you, they're all over the map. The average size, I think, is about, um, what would you say weight-wise, Bruce? They're such an odd fish. Yeah, five to six pounds, maybe, average? Five to six pounds. The biggest ones are the mustachio triggers. I caught the biggest mustachio of my life on our last trip, and it had to be uh 12 pounds maybe um of course i thought i could just land it myself while the guide was recording a video uh, <laughs> the, guide, so well. the guide hit stop instead of start when i handed him the camera so I, we don't have any evidence of that so you can believe me or not believe me but that mustachio trigger that i caught was probably every bit of 12 pounds it was a beast um, were you with Eckes that day no i was with TK that day it was TK um, he talked to me about that fish and he told me something I didn't know about triggers those fish get into that 10 to 12 pound range I mean they're disgustingly huge and they say that those fish can be in the range of 20 to 30 years old yeah you could this guy looked like an old warrior and he wasn't afraid of anything this was such an unusual experience for a trigger because he I hooked him and then he came off which happens a lot with triggers and then I thought, oh, darn it. Because, you know, we saw him and I was like, oh, 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 that's the biggest trigger I've ever seen. I was freaking out. And then I made the cast and hooked him. And I couldn't believe I hooked him. I was just going nuts. And then um, I just put a dubbing body on that. That is the same dubbing I used on the other fly. That's the light Cahill Hairtron dubbing. Anyway, I hooked that. I hooked that fish and I was just going nuts. And then he came off and I was all bummed out. And then he swam into the deep water and I thought he went into his hole. He's sulking. We're just standing there talking. And about two seconds later, he comes out of his hole and starts swimming towards me. And I, I couldn't even believe it. And I made a cast and he came up and ate it. It was like what we call, what do we call it, Bruce? We call that a Jesus fish. <laughs> okay. that is a gift you gotta have them. now you can either think of it as a gift from the good lord or you can think of it when you hook it again after you've already hooked it once you go jesus i can't believe he ate that the second time yeah so we we are well, very amy listen when i was playing college baseball i managed to hit a few home runs and the moral of that story is sometimes it's better to be lucky than good that's always the case with fishing i think all right, right. So I've dubbed a little body. That light Cahill matches matches this uh, sand color really well. And I'm just getting all the guard hairs out. I'm getting hair all over myself, all over the office, 
all over the keyboards, all over the mouse. It's everywhere back here. This should stay in a fly tying room, but we don't have the 5K at home, so we have to do fly tying videos here. It's okay. John just texted me and says he'll clean up for you. <laughs> Great. I don't think <laughs> He's cleaning up on whiskey drinking right now. All right. So I'm just going to, I flipped the fly over after I dubbed that little meaty body. And now I'm just going to tie in the wing and I'm tying it right in here, the front of the fly and try not to have a huge head, but a little bit's okay. We're going to use my favorite tool, the cautery tool after I get this tied down. I'm going to whip finish with my hand because I don't even remember how to really use a whip finishing tool. I could probably figure it out. But I whip finished Man, that. that was so smooth with your fingers. I wouldn't have even have said that if I were you. That was mastery. Uh, now I'm going to put a little uh, glue on the, on the thread. Because if I don't put glue on the thread when I bring out the cautery tool... Sorry, this is hard to get it out of here. Let me just, oh, ah! Now it came flying out. Uh, we'll get those extra fibers cemented down to your tying area somehow. Yeah, well, now I just got a drop of UV resin on the desk here. I'm sure that my coworkers will appreciate that later. All right. So now I've got the, the thread all covered with UV thread, uh, with UV resin. And I'm going to cut it and clean it up. Does anyone here have a cautery tool? I think it's the greatest thing. I hope this one works. So this is, you do have one, Bruce. This is a cautery tool. You can see it turning red. It gets really hot and it allows you to clean everything up hair-wise. At a fly tying, at a fly shop named a shoot angler. Actually, we were at the doctor the other day not the other day, months ago, before all this. And uh, I had like a little skin tag or something and the doctor burned it off. And afterwards, I'm like, can I have that pottery tool? You're not going to just throw it away, are you? So you, if you know somebody who's a, like a general practitioner, you can get yourself a whole bunch of these probably for free. If you don't are mind. They're pretty much the exact they, same tool. It's the exact same tool. Well, this one has a replaceable tip. So because the cautery tool gets messed up, this has a replaceable tip. But I'm trying to burn all that hair off, and it's kind of working. There we go. And that is... Yeah, I mean, that works on natural hair synthetics alike. Yeah, that's a peaking prawn. It's peeking at you right now. So... Can I be truthful and tell you a story about that fly, Amy? Please do, Bruce. Oh, I think we lost Amy momentarily. No, you didn't lose me. We lost you. Amy, are you ready for a story about that fly? I'm so ready, Bruce. Ooh. Bruce, come on. This is my moment to shut I've heard all oh, of Bruce's I, stories. I lost the voice. And so he showed me the fly, and I thought it looked cool, but I was kind of like, meh. And I don't remember if you were walking back to the boat with a guy, literally done fishing, and there was a big bonefish, like right hand side. You literally just looked at it and said, oh, there's a fish. Unpinned your fly, popped it, and wiggled the rod tip. And I was like, well, now I have about 48 of those tied. I saw that thing do some stuff that blew my mind. I love that fly. That was the day we fished together. That was fun. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we have pretty much concluded the fly tying live hour. We had a little bit of a transmission kick up in the middle. We went a little long. Thanks, everybody that tuned in and sent a question. Beulah will be back on YouTube Live next Tuesday night from 5 to 6 with a mystery guest tire. Pay attention to YouTube and Instagram for the live poster, and we'll let you know who it's going to be. Thanks again for everybody that stopped by and took a look. Amy, Hazel, 
if you we want to tie, take a special thanks for you taking some time out of your day and tying with us. Yeah, if you guys want to, any else to tie these flies to shootsangler.com. We have them all. Thanks for watching. Yep. Thanks again, Amy. It was great to spend some time with you. All right. Thanks, Percy. Good job. See you later. Bye, everybody, and tying then. Are we off the air? Oh, we're not off the air. Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Were you nervous? Me? No, I just yeah. didn't. I just didn't want to like forget a material because I was so rushed going into this. Oh. Had that question for you. The voice transmission was cutting out, and I didn't know if you were still telling about.